Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker for today, uh, Acting Assistant Secretary for the Administration for Children and Families under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, George Sheldon. Uh, formerly co uh, Florida's Secretary of Children and Family Services, and at which he was also co-chair of Florida's Human Trafficking Task Force. Uh, we are thrilled that he has joined uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, and very much because of his broad view of the issue, he's able to uh, understand and integrate how the issue of domestic minor sex trafficking or commercial sexual exploitation of children fits in under so many of the offices and so many of the agencies that are in his in his department. So uh, let me just ask, please ask Mr. Sheldon and let's welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and welcome to Washington. Uh, I've only been here a year and a half myself, uh, so um, I was Secretary of the Department in Florida, and I'm trying to learn how the federal government works, as you probably are as well. Uh, my uh, Deputy Secretary in Florida told me when I got here that uh, Washington was 68 square miles surrounded by reality. Uh, and, and I think I've learned that day after day after day. Uh, but I think there are some very exciting things happening uh, here, and I, I want to thank you for what you do. Um, I, I see so many friends, Gene, from, uh, from his house in Miami. We worked together on the response to the earthquake in Haiti. Uh, so many individuals uh, that I've met around the country, from Seattle to, to New York. Uh, and um, it is so good to be with you uh, here, because you really are the thought leaders uh, and the advocates on the front line uh, on the whole issue of human trafficking. And I don't say that lightly. Uh, I, I want to thank you for being here, and I thank you for uh, kind of being uh, pilgrims in the wilderness for so long. Uh, because I think to a large extent in this arena, uh, what you've been doing has been lonely. Uh, because you've been voices out there that I think were ahead of your times. Uh, I know and you know that all forms of human trafficking are an affront to our common humanity. Uh, but trafficking in children is an act so incomprehensibly vile uh, that it is really hard to even imagine. Uh, I've seen that in individual children. I know you have. And yet today we see it uh, day after day all across the country in our towns, in our schools, in our group homes, and in too many, too many places. You have sounded that bell for so long, uh, and you've refused to stand down when others have told you that this was an issue uh, that was too small, or whose time hadn't come. And you, were, you have refused to stand down, and that's a testament really to your courage and your determination to be heard. Uh, you've sounded that bell for so long, and uh, like others, you've taken up a cause in an unflagging commitment to justice. I'm proud to stand here with you today uh, and affirm the Department of Health and Human Services' commitment to stand with you. And to a large extent, and I say this respectfully, the Department of Health and Human Services and the federal government has been late to the cause. Uh, to some extent, states have been ahead of the federal government. Uh, but that has changed. Uh, and I think it is in large tribute to the pressure uh, that you have been putting on day after day after day, and sometimes uh, uh, without a whole lot of encouragement. Um, I think the issues that uh, you're discussing have been important to me for some time. Uh, I was an obscure associate dean at a small law school in Miami uh, when we did our first symposium on human trafficking. And quite frankly, it was the first I had been exposed to the issue. And I, like other Americans, basically said, no, it can't be true in this country. Uh, but I learned so much uh, from survivors who testified during that symposium. 
and then as Secretary of the Department, uh, co-chairing the statewide task force with the uh, Commissioner of our Department of Law Enforcement on Human Trafficking, and seeing particularly in Miami where there was an aggressive federal task force, uh, but recognizing that it was running throughout the state. Uh, you know, obviously large concentration in, in an urban area like Miami, but seeing in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, which I thought was kind of the bastion of purity. Uh, seeing in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, the FBI bring down a trafficking ring who had 12 women in one house and were leasing them out to men in the fields for $25 for 15 minutes. And so I think as we go through this, you can't say, well, it's only Miami, it's only Los Angeles, it's only New York. It's only Chicago, it's Tallahassee, it's Toledo, uh, it's St. Louis, it's throughout the country. And I, and I think that um, these, this is a relatively new problem to the federal government. But it, um, I really believe that all that has changed. And you're seeing an attention right now by the federal government as never before. A coordinated approach directed by the White House to engage every single agency of the federal government, from the Department of Health and Human Services to the Department of Transportation to the Department of Labor, to say this has got to be part of our agenda and we've got to say in this country that human trafficking can end and believe it. I, I really believe that you know, many of you have said we're at a tipping point. I, I think it's also kind of a perfect storm uh, where the, uh, you have a president who is committed, a White House that is committed, the National Association of Attorneys General has targeted this as the number one priority, the National uh, Conference of, of State Legislators have targeted this as a priority, and now you've got uh, individual uh, philanthropic organizations like Humanity United, uh, and others who are saying we want to be part of this process, to be part of a victory in this area. You know, we used to dismiss this as simply another form of prostitution, uh, as, as to if somehow that this was just a personal problem, uh, an issue that really didn't concern us. Uh, we used to ignore the victims and their needs because it was either easier to turn away uh, from any responsibility and say it's not my problem. But those days are over, and I think there is no turning back now. Never again will we say in the United States government that we don't understand there's an issue. Never again will we say that we will turn our back on the issue of human trafficking. But it wasn't easy getting here. You know that. No one, not the federal government, not the states, not local organizations can combat these problems alone. And I recognize that, and I know you do too. It is time to create a continuum of care that provides safe, licensed, and supportive shelters. It is time to get licensing and policy decisions right so that we do not subject victims of trafficking to re-abuse. It is time to create therapeutic interventions and services to meet the diverse needs of individual victims. You know, as I saw this issue in Florida and have traveled the country, the cases still haunt me. Uh, in Jacksonville, a man recruited two minors from Virginia for prostitution by promising them lavish vacations in Florida and elsewhere. In another case, an Orlando man met a 17-year-old girl online and promised to make her a star. Instead, he forced her into prostitution in California and Las Vegas uh, by simply using the services of Craigslist. I recently visited a center in Chicago and talked to six women, ages 13 to 21, uh, some of whom had been, been trafficked for over three years. And their number one fear, obviously, was the fear of the trafficker, that the trafficker would find them. But there was also a more haunting fear that they articulated, 
And that was the belief that they had no human value other than the body. Because their psychic had been so broken down, their, their sense of self-worth and self-respect, that it will take a long time for psychological recovery. To say nothing about keeping them out of the grips of the trafficker who's trying to find them on an ongoing basis. And, you know, I, I stood there trying to offer some hope, some promise of a better life, uh, but really uh, trying to convince them of something that all of their life they've been told was impossible. Uh, and uh, it, it really struck me how important the work we do is. Um, it really struck me how they'd been robbed of probably the single most important thing that any of us as, as human beings possess, and that's our sense of self-worth and purpose. Um, two months ago, survivors of human trafficking, uh, uh, we invited to speak to our senior leadership with the Administration for Children and Families. And one by one, they told their stories, their personal te testimony of how they'd suffered. Uh, one woman, who was probably 37, uh, indicated that she had been abducted uh, at the age of about 14. Luckily for her, her, she escaped after three weeks. And this is now, what, 20 years later, 22 years later, and those three weeks still haunt her. Uh, and they will haunt her probably for the rest of her life. But she's dealing with it. She's not going to let it win. It is evident how difficult it is for trafficking victims to come forward and self-identify. <clears throat> A lot of those, some who are foreign victims, are afraid of the law enforcement in the first place. And that same thing is true with domestic minor victims. And you can almost tell what the profile is that the trafficker targets. In discussions we've had with the, with the FBI, uh, the new recruiting areas, high schools, and large group homes. And what is the common thread that runs through too many of those children? Disaffected, uh, disillusioned, uh, maybe a bad home environment, no friends feeling that they don't belong anywhere, and somebody, maybe dashing, uh, befriends them. In many cases, for the first time in their lives. And all of a sudden, that person who befriended them becomes their worst enemy. All of a sudden, it is converted from a friend to can you help me out pay the light bill this month? And you know the rest of the story. For all those reasons, these victims fear reaching out to law enforcement. In many cases, they fear reaching out to health care providers and others who may be in a position to help them. Clearly, one of the big tasks that we have is better coordination among the federal agencies, state governments, not-for-profits, so that we see each other as allies and work together. So that provider networks come to the table and basically begin to demand coordination and cooperation from governmental agencies. I am pleased that Secretary Sevillius has says this is a priority for the Department of Health and Human Services. And that yes, we can be on the forefront. I know and you know additional federal resources have to come to the table. But that doesn't mean in the meantime that we can't provide definite guidance to the states and the child welfare systems and the homeless and runaway youth systems as to the magnitude of this problem. For too long, the child welfare system has said, it's not my problem. We don't do human trafficking, we do child welfare. What in the name of heaven is more important to a child's welfare than to not be a victim of human trafficking?
I think some of you were at the Clinton Global Initiative when the President highlighted this issue. And, and I remember somebody saying to me that no President since Abraham Lincoln has devoted more time in a speech to the issue of human trafficking. That is a ch huge change in where we're going. And the President said that day, and I quote, our message today to them is to the millions around the world, we see you, we hear you, we insist on your dignity, and we share your belief that if given the chance, you will forge a life equal to your talents and worthy of your dreams. That has got to be our mission here today. So just what are we doing in terms of really responding to the needs of victims? According to the Human Trafficking Resource Center, shelter is the number one requested service referral for U.S. citizens, for foreign nationals, for adults, and for children. Over almost 3,000 survivors of human trafficking have called the national hotline directly, many expressing their unique challenges to accessing shelter services due to the lack of identification documents, not meeting residency requirements, other challenges. In many ways, like any fledgling movement, our biggest issue is having the capacity to actually address the issues at hand. So we are currently working with members of Congress to create new capacity to coordinate anti-trafficking efforts across the Administration for Children and Families, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, ACYF, and across to other federal departments like the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Labor. As we develop the, the new federal response and coordinate our efforts across programs, we're trying to pay close attention to developing a government-wide strategic action plan for victim services. This long-term five-year plan that covers all victims of all forms of human trafficking has to happen. We've been in the drafting stage for some time, and we are seeking inputs from stakeholders. Because the one thing is I started out my comments, all knowledge doesn't reside here in Washington. The problems aren't here in Washington. They're in New York and Miami and Toledo. Well, maybe the problems are in Washington. So. <laughs> but we're eager to hear your ideas and your input. Uh, we are convening a technical working group of about 40 people on December the 10th at the White House, uh, made up of providers uh, and advocates, uh, researchers from universities, uh, those from non-governmental uh, organizations, uh, and those from, uh, there will be federal observers from all agencies, but I want to hear what real people say who've been doing this work for some period of time, uh, not what people think here in Washington. One of the areas that I've directed staff is to find ways to do more for victims of human trafficking within the child welfare and the homeless and runaway youth systems. No longer is it acceptable for the child welfare system to say it's not our job. No longer is it acceptable for runaway and homeless youth centers to not get engaged. So we're continuing to work with those entities to provide additional guidance, and that should be forthcoming soon. Our homeless and runaway youth programs are providing more tr professional training to strengthen services for victims of human trafficking through basic center programs, transitional living programs, street outreach programs. Our Technical Assistance Center has begun coordinating more with the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, offering several tra traffic-related webinars and resources, including an issue brief and a five-course training curriculum and links to reviews on evidence-based trauma. We have learned so much as a government about the impacts of trauma on children, children who've experienced the disaster like what just happened with Sandy in New York and New Jersey, but, the, but what bigger traumatic event can there be in a child's life than to be victimized by a trafficker? The runaway and homeless youth have put out now four new funding opportunities 
which ex exclude, which includes specific language to require uh, background and training in human trafficking. So we're just beginning to really work more closely with child welfare agencies, with protective investigators, with case managers, in an effort to reach out and serve trafficking victims. But there is also a clear connection with domestic violence. And I think we've got to recognize it. By working with domestic violence shelter providers and coalitions, I believe that we can amplify our efforts and augment our capacity to do even more. Just as there was a turning point in the area of domestic violence, when we finally said it is no longer acceptable to beat your spouse, it is not a way of life that's acceptable, we in the area of human trafficking have also got to say that this is not acceptable behavior to be a John. It is not acceptable behavior to participate in the practice. And I also believe that just as it is illegal to have sex with a minor, then how can a minor consent to sex? Well, there's so much more that needs to be done to combat slavery in its modern day form. And a great deal of the work to bring victims out of the shadows has to happen. And to reintegrate them into their own lives from which they were so unnecessarily detached. And though we need to do more, much more, I can honestly say that I don't think I've seen people who worked harder with more dedication than people like you and people throughout the country to keep this issue on the front burner. When others were saying, we've got to deal with the fiscal cliff, when others were saying, we've got to deal uh, with the problems uh, in, our, in our foreign communities, you have tirelessly said that this is a basic human issue that if we're going to call ourselves a modern, civilized society, we've got to strongly reject. And I compliment you for having done that. I would close my comments with some words that uh, President Obama gave at that uh, Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, when he said, our fight against human trafficking is one of the great human rights causes of our time. And the United States will continue, continue to lead it in partnership with you. The change we seek will not come easy, but we can strength, draw strengths from the movements of the past. For we know that every life saved, in the words of that great proclamation, is an act of justice worthy of the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. I compliment you. We are pleased to be part of the fight with you and want you to demand every single element of resource available to the federal and state government until such time as we have eradicated modern day slavery. Thank you very much. Well, you know, you hear jokes about a few groups of us, you know, politicians, lawyers, and uh, government, um, folks that work in government. I think you're a lawyer, too, aren't you? Are you a lawyer or a psychologist? Sorry. You're not a lawyer? Yeah I, know. yeah, I know. But isn't that cool? He's two out of three. And he's really great. Um, there are people that this just touches their heart. And not very long ago, uh, when we were meeting, I realized he's just plain real. He's not going to change locations as he didn't from Florida to D.C. and change who he is. I actually think what we have is a real advocate, a leader, and a capable person who is going to make change. He knows the truth. He's worked it. He's experienced it. 
um, in Florida trying to change. I looked at the things he did in Florida and I go, boy, if he could do that in Florida, he's going to really rock things. So we welcome you to this uh, place that is a little crazy, but uh, he's been here quite two years, three years. Pardon? You've been here two years or three years? Uh, year and a half. Year and a half. I think he just said it felt like three. I have the honor of introducing somebody I've admired for some time. Uh, Swami Hunt is the founder and chair of the Hunt Alternative Fund. Without going into all of her different titles, one of them is ambassador. She was the ambassador to Austria. But what she's become to me is the voice against the reason that we need shelter for children's broken hearts and bodies to heal, why we need services. And she's one of the first ones who said if men weren't buying, although something like this, she'll say it much better, they were out there shopping, other men would not be snatching and renting or selling the innocence of our children. So simple, so true, but then she started pulling people together convening in an abolition movement that she's going to talk about. But at the same time, she helped bring together funding. And you know, at noon, we had the, uh, the caucus on how do we get money to this issue? And now we're talking again about how do we define the standards of shelter, services, and they are tied. Because when there are people that get it, like a Swami Hunt, and then she has something she can show to others. When we have standards documents, we have an understanding of what's out there, we can actually go to people like Aswani or others and say, hey, we know what we're doing now. Will you help us? And we clearly define the problem. Well, demand wasn't quite as hard as defining standards for shelter and services. That's going to be kind of hard. But I will tell you, she's got it right. The most important issue is prevention by fighting demand. So I would like to introduce you to a strong leader in this movement who's been there, who will be there, and you wouldn't want to take her on unless she was on your side, <laughs> Swami Hunt. Well, Linda was one of the very first people I met when, I, uh, when our foundation, Hunt Alternatives Fund, decided that the, this would be a focus. I had started writing about uh, the sex trafficking of women and girls uh, back in 97. I wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs while I was ambassador, and that then was brought to Congress, and I'm told that, that the GTIP office at State was a result of, of that article which very much surprised me. Uh, did, George, did you see how moved people, some people were when you were talking about the response, the new response of the government? I mean, this is not, this is not just about you know, legislative halls of power or, or the Washington labyrinth. This is about lives and the people in this room. You know, oh, by the way, I used to, um, to co-direct a halfway house with young adults with mental illnesses. I, I do actually know something about what it's like to be face-to-face -face morning, noon, and night uh, with people in shelters of various sorts. So, uh, so the people in this room, they have been the ones being sheltered. They, they have been face-to-face -face with, arm-in-arm -arm with the ones being sheltered. They've been working with airlines. They've been working with hotels. They have been lobbying Congress. You know, the energy in this room around what you said was palpable. So could we please again thank you. And, and especially, did you hear the applause when you said, what in the name of heaven is more important to child welfare than human trafficking? I and mean, that, was, that was a powerful moment. 
so, so here's how we approached it in our foundation. We, we decided we wanted to do something about sex trafficking in the United States. I do a lot of work globally, but this was going to be just the, U, the U.S. We said it's going to be sustained over 10 years. We're going to put $10 million of our own money into it, and we will try very hard to bring others into this. And so then we, we started talking with people, talking with Linda, talking with, with everyone we could find, Polaris and you know, many others. And we said, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What's missing? What's missing? What's missing? And the what's missing part was uh, uh, really focusing on the guys, the, the buyers. And that was, we didn't want anyone to stop for one you know, hour what they were doing to rescue to rehabilitate, to counsel, to, the, to work with people, particularly children who've been victimized. Uh, but what we decided to do was fill a different piece. So we, we looked at it as an economic model. We said, okay, you know, here's the supply, here's the demand, and here's the distribution. So how do you stop the supply of girls, women, who are feeling, as you said, broken? who are coming from homes that, that can be you know, really, I don't have to explain to you. Okay, you know, you know who these girls are. You know that when a 13 year old who's been trafficked, because she is by definition trafficked, if she's under 18, it doesn't matter if she says she's willing, she is being trafficked. So you, what happens on her 18th birthday? She's suddenly, excuse me, she's voluntary on her 18th birthday? Please, you know? So, so we can focus, 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 focus on the, the girls and women, and if you put them on a stand, what are you doing? Having them testify against the only person they ever called daddy? I mean, really? Is that what you're going to do? So, but, so it's very, very hard to imagine actually stopping sex trafficking by only focusing on the women and girls. Well, let's, okay, so we can't, we can't manage the guys because boys will be boys, but let's, okay, there went the girls. So, okay, let's focus on the traffickers. Okay, so let's, let's build a case against a trafficker. Let's build a case, and a lot of them are pimps, as you know. So, let's see. Oh, they're making a quarter of a million dollars on every, on every girl. Okay, well, what does that mean in terms of the defense lawyers they can hire? And you know the number of prosecutors who build that case over six months, over nine months, over a year, and lose? I mean, it is amazing when you talk to prosecutors. That's why they often won't take the cases, because they want to win a case. They don't want to have a case that's, that they can't win. Well, we can't, okay, well, that's kind of tough, but we can't do the men because boys will be boys. Ah. Well, well, let's look at, I mean, maybe we can. Maybe we have to think about the men, the buyers. Who are they? Conservative estimate, 15%. Not going to count the boys, not going to count the oldest men. Still gives me 100 million, so 15% is 15 million. What? What? 15 million men? What? Who are these guys? Like, who are these downtrodden? They're 15 million downtrodden, despairing men? I hear no on the second, on the second <laughs> row here. No, they're white, majority are white. They live in the suburbs and they have children. And you all know that. There's a whole range, but, but that's but that's the majority. Do you know any of them? I know a few, one or two pimps. I know a, not, quite a few survivors. Do I know any Johns? <laughs> Actually, I know a lot of Johns. I don't necessarily know their Johns. They sit near me or next to me in the Quaker meeting that I go to. They're at the black church I go to on the Sundays I'm not at the Quaker meeting. Uh, actually, you know, they are 
at conferences I go to, they, uh, I just learned at Thanksgiving, there were only 19 of us around the table. I learned the day after Thanksgiving that one of my family members was a John. There were only 19 of us around the table, half of them men, right? Family member, we're well off. Well, so you get the picture. I'm not describing anything you don't know, but so boys will be boys. Well, interestingly enough, to your point, exactly to your point, in 1980s, early 80s, I'm 62, so I, I go back. So in the early 80s, <laughs> I worked on helping create a, a coalition of shelters for domestic violence across Colo uh, Colorado. Because we had now at that point seven shelters. We want to get them all together, you know, so they could apply for funding. And I first grant of Hunt Alternatives Fund, our foundation, was to a shelter for battered women. And at some point we said, why are all these women, why is the burden on these women to leave home, to run away, to be told you know, by a threatening man, I'm coming back for you and the kids, I'm gonna kill the children and you, you know, if you, if you sign a complaint, if you call the police, I go, why, why is that on them? You know, why is it not on the guys? And so we got a law changed in Colorado that said that in fact, when they're screaming and crying and the neighbors call, and the police, the police can come in and doesn't say it's a family affair. And not only that, when he comes in, let's say it's a he, the police, he doesn't have to ask her what happened in front of a man who is hot and sweating and she's got a split lip, right? That's enough. She doesn't sign anything. He takes the guy away. That one change in the law in increased the safety of women all across this country as it was replicated. That is what happens when you go upstream and say, is there something we can do to help prevent this victimization? And out of that came, in fact, a cultural shift organized all across this country. Isn't it amazing how, in fact, boys can't be boys if what that means is they go home and they slug their wife or their girlfriend. Isn't that interesting? That boys actually don't have to be whatever they want to be as boys. So all we need to do is make an extension of what we've done with domestic violence to say, no, you don't buy the bodies of children or the women they become, yeah. all right? And in our work, and I'm not saying this is how you should do it, in our work, we don't draw a line at 18 because we think that, that that's actually a false <laughs> line. That's really interesting. I didn't know that you all would applaud at that. No, they, no, I'm serious. I, I, I actually didn't know. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, so anyway, I'm going to close and say, um, how do we do it? We don't know how to do it. Actually, we asked the guys how to do it. We think they're probably the, they're the best source. And you know what they said when we asked a hundred buyers in Boston, what would deter you? This is so interesting. Go on at demandabolition.org and find this research, but I'll just tell you the tidbits as I close. Um, my favorite is actually that 71% said they would stop if their car was going to be impounded. <laughs> you have to let that one just sit there for a while. You really do. Um, okay. Guys, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me if I say something about boys and their toys? No, it's just, you know, I just like, that just strikes me. Oh, geez. Like, we know how they love their cars. Okay, so the, the other thing is, here's a really interesting comparison. 88% said they would stop if they would be um, listed as a sex offender on the sex offenders list. But, but get this, 
The same number, 88% said they would stop if there was going to be a letter home. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Now, the lowest we saw was 38% said they would stop if they were going to be in some educational program. But guess what? The research actually said that the John School, you all know about it, Norma Hotelling in San Francisco, a survivor. The research on that John School said that 40% decrease in recidivism. So if you, want to find, if you want to conjecture about whether or not these guys are actually telling the truth about what will deter them, they nailed it. 38% said that would deter them, and 40% is the research in terms of the recidivism. Isn't that interesting? Can we stop? Could we as, do something as simple as send guys to a one- or two-day John school and, and have a 40% decrease in what you all are working on with the child trauma, with being sexual? Isn't that amazing to think? Isn't that wild? But, you know, obviously they all depend on being arrested. So that's the job we're working on is to figure out why the cops don't arrest and, and then what to do about that. So more on that, go look at demandabolition.com. The, the, the last thing I'll say, which is the very, very, very good news, is that the men have told us what will stop them and they can stop. They really, truly can stop, with very few exceptions. Men can stop, and I mean, that may mean 12-step programs for them. You know, it may mean very high fines. It, it, it doesn't have to be a burden. I mean, I'm, if you're talking about children, you, it is a felony. They must, be, they must be arrested, they must be prosecuted. But the point is, men can stop, and we in this room are the ones who will help them do that. Thank you so much.